Hello. Good morning. My name is Omar Farooq. I'm a nephrologist and associate chief medical officer at Penn State Health. Hello, and I'm Faisal Aziz. I'm chief of vascular surgery at uh, Penn State University. So to, for our audience, a little bit of introduction. Omar and myself are classmates from medical school. And over the course of past three decades, we have we have learned a lot from each other and for our, from our mentors and teachers. There's something which is which is common among us, and it, and that is our passion for learning the leadership in healthcare. For past few years or so, we have been uh, interviewing and learning from several healthcare leaders across the nation, and we thought that instead of uh, just two of us learning, um, why shouldn't we share this with our audience as well? That being said, today we have Dr. Robert Harba with us. Dr. Robert Harba, he is an extraordinary physician, educator, mentor, and a leader. He did his medical school from the Penn State College of Medicine in neurosurgery training at Dartmouth. He returned to Penn State back in 2003 as the chair of neurosurgery department, the first graduate from the alma mater coming back to take this highest leadership position at the institution. He ran the department for 18 years and now he is transitioning from his role as the chair of neurosurgery department to take the leadership position at the healthcare systems level as the senior vice president of the medical group. He has published more than 450 articles, a huge number, several book chapters. He has mentored many, many people and the future generation of the neurosurgeons. He has served as visiting professor at 75 academic institutions worldwide, 75. Wow. All righty. So Dr. Ha, when, whenever we're interviewing the healthcare leaders, one of the parameters for success is the leader's influence at the national level societies. Uh, and Dr. Harba has held several key positions at the national level. Most importantly, he has been the president of Association of America, American Association of Neurological Surgeons from 2014 to 2015, and also won a Distinguished Service Award in 2018. More importantly, for, for Society for Neurosurgeons, the most distinguished award for them is Harvey Cushing Award, and Dr. Robert Harba is the recipient of that distinguished award in 2021. Besides that, he has also been the chair of the RSC Committee for ACGME uh, for, for neurosurgery, speaking very highly of his commitment towards the education of neurosurgeons across the country. So Dr. Harba, thank you so much for taking your time today to meet with us. I guess my first question is simple. Tell us about your journey. What brought you to the field of neurosurgery and, and through your successful journey throughout your career and what keeps you going? Well, first, thanks uh, to both of you for this opportunity. You know, it's, it's a real honor for me to, uh, to be able to, to do this. Um, I think I really have to start my, my journey with um, my, my, my childhood. Um, you know, I grew up um, not too far from here in York County, Pennsylvania. Uh, my parents were uh, horse trainers, and um, that's what they really loved. They really loved the horses, but um, you don't make much money doing that. <clears throat> and so uh, when my brother was born, he had a very severe asthma, and the medical bills kind of uh, kept growing and growing and growing. And so um, for uh, a number of years, I lived with my grandparents, um, and that was that made a big difference. I mean, my, my grandfather was uh, not, not a highly educated man, but a self-educated man. Um, I mean, he taught himself to read Latin. I still have one of his books where he did the translations. And he really instilled in me a, a, a love of learning, um, an idea that if, if you apply yourself, there's nothing you can't do. And I think that uh, kind of early experience makes a uh, a big difference. Um, went to a small college, um, Lebanon Valley College, again, not too far from here, and uh, wasn't sure what I wanted um, to do. But my advisor at that time um, said, you, you really ought to think about medical school. Uh, so I did. 
And um, the first place I um, applied to was Penn State. When I would travel from college home, I'd always drive past the, <clears throat> the Hershey Medical Center. And I thought, boy, this would be a dream come true if I could end up here um, in, in medical school, the new school then. And um, uh, I did get uh, an interview. And, um, you know, when, when we sit here now and we talk about how we're going to plan our lives and give people advice, um, I, I always smile a little bit because when I look at my own experience, there's an awful lot of uh, serendipity uh, involved. So in my case, um, you know, I um, read a brief biography of Harvey Cushing before I started my medical school interviews, not because I had any particular interest in neurosurgery. It's just one of those books. It was a book written by a secretary. It wasn't a, you know, very scholarly effort, but, but just, you know, something to, to read before you go to sleep. Um, but my first um, interview here um, at Hershey uh, was with Dr. Berglund. And Dr. Berglund at that time was the chief of neurosurgery. Um, and I can, you know, remember him sitting me down and one of his first questions to me was, who are your medical heroes? And so I didn't have any medical heroes. I really hadn't even thought much about going to medical school up until a few months before. But you know, when you're asked a question uh, on an interview, you have to give an answer. Mm -hmm. And the only uh, you know physician surgeon I knew much about was Cushing. And so I said, well, I've always kind of admired um, you know, Dr. Cushing. And so he asked me a few questions to make sure I really knew something about Cushing. But then for the rest of the interview, he did all the talking. Um, I, and I sat there and listened. Um, I found out later that you know, he, he viewed himself as Cushing's grandson because the Cushing's last resident hmm. was uh, his mentor hmm. and Berglund was the last resident of that person. So he's had this lineage he traced back and he just idolized Cushing. Um, so uh, I don't know if it was because of that or not, but I did get accepted here. And um, it was actually the only medical school I interviewed at. You know, once I got the acceptance, I said, this is, is where I want to go. Um, and when I started here as a uh, first year student, I got a, a call from uh, Berglund asking if I'd like to work in his lab. And of course, you know, this was the era of the chief of neurosurgery asked the medical student, um, do you want to paint my house? You know, the answer mm -hmm. was what color? Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so I was really honored, and, but I got, got into neurosurgery very, very early and never um, regretted it. It, it. It's been a great career. That's so beautiful what you said, because I think, you know, most of us can relate to the role of mentors. Yeah. Uh, you know, both of us are similar. We, none, of our, none of the family members were physicians, and I look back, there were some strong mentors which, you know, decided our career trajectories where we are today. And that's what I was thinking as well, the power of mentorship. I think you had your ideas. There was this, so your mentor really helped you to develop, show you the path, and then you latched on. And um, let's switch gear and talk about your department and how you transformed the department. A common question asked is, what have you built and who have you developed? This is a beautiful time to ask this question because instead of looking forward, now we are, we are looking back 18 years ago when we started, there were five faculty members, including the PhD scientists. And when you are leaving or transitioning, there are 34 faculty members. There's a residency program with 21 residents. The NIH, NIH funding bank is 17. 17. Uh, how did you do this? How did you transform your department? Well, uh, I came down here a year before I took the chair job as a consultant um, to look at the um, neurosurgery program, which was a mess. Um, and, um, but I got to interview lots of people from various departments and 
um, you know, got to learn a lot about the organization and, um, you know, wrote up a report and the report included things like, well, you know, if you want neurosurgery to thrive, you should make it a department and you need, you know, this kind of equipment and this kind of support. And, and so, um, much to my surprise, they took it seriously and, um, actually, you know, made neurosurgery department, um, that was in the works. They had a national, uh, search for a neurosurgery chair. Um, so, you know, I already knew a lot about the place. And one of the things I'd seen when I was here is it, it was a, truly a program in trouble, but with an enormous potential. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're the closest academic medical center for like three and a half million people mm -hmm. in the center of the state. We're uh, uh, tied to um, a research intensive, large uh, university. Um, this was home for me. I love the area. So it, it looked like a, a great opportunity opportunity and so I threw my hat in the ring for the the chair job and um, um, decided to come here when I did my negotiating with the dean um, this institution had no money to spend at that time this was shortly after the merger with another health system and the demerger and, and so I uh, wrote up my wish list and the wish list um, really didn't have any dollars with it. Mm -hmm. Didn't say I need this many dollars in my academic enhancement funds. And, but it did say if I can attract um, high quality um, subspecialty neurosurgeons in these areas, I, I want your promise that I'll be able to to hire them as long as I can show that they're profitable. Um, that over the course of time, we need some technology that we don't have now for the OR and ICU care, et, et cetera. And, um, you know, got that in writing. And, uh, I must say one of the things that I've been very pleased with is, um, you know, Penn State was always true to its word. Mm -hmm. You know, if that something was agreed to, you didn't have to argue about it later, even if the dean changed. Which has happened a few times, um, but but so so I had the the blueprint to move forward, and it, it was pretty straightforward. I mean, you want to hire people who have subspecialty expertise because you know that's what sets apart a, an academic uh, medical center. You want to hire people who, um, to the best of your ability, you believe are. Uh, motivated to not only take care of patients and do that very well, but to, to teach, to, to do research, to be academically productive. And then to, to hire people that, um, you know, fit the culture that, that are going to be, um, able to work with other people easily. Um, when I got here, um, uh, two of the faculty members had very, um, uh, corrosive uh, personalities, mm -hmm. and it's always uh, difficult to um, ask people to leave, um, especially if you start out with a small group. But, um, you know, one lesson I've learned is sometimes you can add by subtracting that as long as those um, people were here, it was going to be hard to recruit additional people. I mean, they're, they're just difficult to get along with. And so, um, over about the first well, nine months, um, those two people went elsewhere, but we brought in a, a lot of new, uh, people. So, uh, some of the people who were here that stayed, Kevin Cockroft, uh, who is going to, uh, was now the interim chair in, in neurosurgery as a national, uh, reputation, um, is, is just a superb, um, individual. And has been here for, from the start. Uh, started our endovascular um, program here. Did, you know, just a wonderful guy, um, Mark Diaz, um, our vice chair for education uh, now. Uh, pediatric neurosurgeon, again nationally recognized, passionate about education. Has had a lot of funding. Um, has stayed for the the entire uh, time. Um, shortly after I started, I managed to, 
uh, recruit um, Jim McInerney. Mm -hmm. Jim had been a resident of mine at Dartmouth, so I knew him to be a, a fine person. And he came and started a, a functional neurosurgery program, um, really from scratch. I mean, we didn't even have a stereotactic frame at the time. And he's built one of the busiest uh, functional neurosurgery programs in the, the country. Um, he's also our program um, director, another person with a, you know, a national reputation. Um, and my wife's a neurosurgeon and is, you know, uh, internationally recognized for her peripheral nerve surgery, particularly nerve tumors. Uh, and I was pretty sure she'd come along, so I think that was a, a, a good chance. Um, but, but the idea is it's, it's, you know, I'd love to take credit for this, but the, the credit is really with those people. You know, it, it's just getting the right people who are going to want to build something. You know, they're not looking to, move into a program that's already set and it's easy and um you know no i want to come and build something uh you know to, together with you know the whole group and so that's been the you know the, the key i think getting the right people uh, from a research standpoint uh had two uh big wins uh, mm -hmm. relatively early uh, one was uh, jim connor um, Jim had been on the search committee uh, here when I was uh, applying, and we had, you know, gotten along well in our, our discussions. At that time, um, Dr. Connor um, had been the interim chair of Neuro and Behavioral Science, you know, the Basic Science uh, Neuroscience Department, had not been chosen as the, the chair. Um, I think he was disappointed by that. Um, was being heavily recruited um, by uh, Johns Hopkins and, um, you know, was, was probably going to leave. Um, and so rather than have him leave, and I said, Jim, what, why don't you move to neurosurgery? We'll make you vice chair for research. Um, you know, it'll be a new model, you know, bringing this kind of basic science uh, ability into a clinical department. Um, Jim was excited about that. It gave the institution a way to keep Jim here. Um, and, and so it worked out well for, for everyone. And, you know, Jim immediately brought, uh, uh an expertise, um, and, uh, you know, a, uh, reality to the research program that would have taken us many years to, to build from, from scratch. Uh, Furthermore, he was really good at working with mm -hmm. other people. You know, Jim's just one of those guys who uh, makes everybody around him better. Um, so, so that was mm -hmm. a big win. And then the next one was um, Steve Schiff. Um, Steve is an MD, PhD, pediatric neurosurgeon. And he was applying you know, a few years later for the chair role in neuron behavioral science. And um, I was interviewing him. Uh, I knew they weren't going to hire an MD to be the, the chair of neuron behavioral science, but I was really fascinated with the work uh, he was doing. And um, so uh, shortly after that interview, I had a, uh, I have an, a joint appointment in engineering science and mechanics at University Park, and I would give a few lectures a, a year up there to their students. And after one of the lectures, I um, met with Judy Todd, their chair, and she said that she had a, a senior position um, in funding for a new faculty member. Um, and, um, you know, did I know anyone? And I said, well, how, how'd you like to hire a neurosurgeon? And um, after I resuscitated her, um, <laughs> I explained what was going on. And so anyway, uh, we set up a... Um, the plan to have Steve come to uh, be the first, you know, the founding director of our Center for Neural Engineering. And at that time, there was a Keystone Innovation Zone grant mm -hmm. program. And um, if, um, you know, Penn State agreed to match uh, that uh, $500,000 grant, if we got it, uh, which would give us a million dollars to help you know, get Steve set up. And so I can remember um, on a, uh, the, the deadline, they, 
that was was like three days away. And so um, Steve, Judy, and I are all on the phone trying to put this grant together in, in rapid fire time to get it in. And we submitted it and we got it. And, you know, in fact, that that started. And Steve's been terrifically productive. I mean, um, he's gotten um, NIH um, Director's Pioneer Award. Uh, transformative uh, research award. Um, uh, I can't lost count of the number of R01 awards, but but that center has brought in really tens of millions of dollars. Um, and and you know it's just again I'd love to take credit for it, but it's just picking the right people. It's hard to go wrong with people like Jim Connor and, and Steve yeah. Schiff. So really, the differentiator factor was uh, focusing on this highly specialized clinical program and building this extraordinary team of high quality talent. Right. And I think it's really your team that probably has uh, um, helped everybody in you. Right. I mean, you know, and again, once you get a, a nucleus of, of people who are doing well and are excited about what they're doing, the next person who comes in to interview feels that. Mm-hmm. And I say, this, so, this is, this is a, a team I want to uh, yeah. be on. Um, and, and maybe even more important, you don't lose many people. Yeah. If it's a constantly revolving door, uh, you spend all your time recruiting. That's not really building. And I've been very fortunate that um, you know, in the time I've been here, as you say, we've gone from you know five faculty to thirty-four, and we've had only um, two faculty who've left voluntarily. Um, um, one who is now the chair of neurosurgery at the University of Indiana, so you know, good for her, um, and uh, one who um, just decided this wasn't the place he he wanted to be. But we haven't had to constantly be replacing people. It's just people stay and then you, you know, get larger over time. Right. So for our audience, what Dr. Harbaugh just said is something beautiful. Uh, because if you read the book from good to great, I mean, they're, where they're interviewed 500 successful leaders, and there was one thing which was unique in all the leaders was they never took the credit. <laughs> they always said, "Well, people came to me and we started working together and made made the team." What you said is so beautiful, because I think for leaders it's important to to give the credit to others, and that's that's true leadership. Well, yeah, I mean, and and. And they deserve it. You know? And you're being so humble about it. Well, but here's the thing. You know, I, I, a couple of uh, things that, that I, I've um, heard. That I often hear people say, well, I treat people with respect. Mm-hmm. I think that's very different than respecting people. Um, and, and I'm afraid too many people learn how to treat people with respect. respect. They They superficially... You know, uh, they won't do anything to offend them or insult them. Yeah. And, um, but that's much different than actually respecting people, saying, you know, I, I want you to be successful. I want you to succeed. And, and if you succeed, I'll succeed. You know, you, you, to, to really respect their their goals, their desires. And I think that's what we need to do, not treat people with respect, Absolutely. but really respect them. Respect is a verb, not a noun. Yes. It's right. such a beautiful no, thing. You said it so beautifully. <laughs> you know, I know you do something more than just building people, developing their careers. I have worked closely with some of your uh, faculty members. And I want to talk to them about you. Their eyes. Lit up. They feel, I see they are brightened. Uh, they respect you, they value your mentorship, and more importantly, they are inspired by you. You must be doing something. There has to be some sort of a heart to heart connection. Do you lead them from heart? How, how do you inspire them? Well, I think there are a couple of things. One is I really like them, I mean, and, and, and respect them. I mean, these are terrific people. You know, I, I see how hard they work. I see their dedication. I understand they're always willing to go the extra mile. I mean, I have a lot of respect, um, you know, for these folks, and and I think they understand that that, that they're that they feel valued. 
Um, it's not just for the number of RVUs they can, you know, generate, but but they have, you know, goals and aspirations that are uh, important. Um, I hope uh, I've never asked uh, any of my faculty to do something I wouldn't do. I think, you know, leading by example is important. You know, if, if you're going to ask people to be academically productive, you should be academically productive. If you're going to ask people to, you know, try to make a national name for themselves, you need to show that, that you're going to put the effort in to do that as, as well. Um, if you expect the faculty to come in to take care of their patients, whether or not, you know, they're on call that night, that's what you do too. So I think, you know, that leading by example and in really, in really caring about the uh, people who are not, not only your faculty members, but your friends and colleagues makes, makes a difference. Thank you. Professor, over to you. Um, and a question for you. So how would you define your leadership style? Oh, um, yeah, I, I think what, what I try to do is to give people very clear expectations. This is what I would like you to accomplish. Um, you can always come to me if you need help. Um, you hit a roadblock, but then leave them alone. You know, don't don't look over their shoulder every day. Don't be criticizing all the time. Don't try to correct everything they do, and they're going to make some mistakes. Um, but but that's okay. That's how you learn. That's how you grow. And and so, um, you know, I if I had to characterize it, it, it's just clear expectations, but give the individual a chance to. You know, accomplish something on his own, uh, on his own, or on her own, so that you know they they feel like they have some autonomy in what they're doing. Nobody likes to be told what to do every minute of every day, mm -hmm. and um, that that that's you know that's a way of really killing initiative. And the last thing in the world you want to do is kill somebody's initiative. Got it. Switching gear a little bit, so I'm a division chief myself, and I understand the core missions of our of our uh, institution. There's clinical excellence, research, and education. Now, when I look up to you and look up to your career, I feel that somehow you were able to accomplish all of them in a very successful manner. Not only that you did yourself, but you inspired others in your department to do that. So my question is, going back two decades ago, where well, you did not see that this is going to evolve this way, what were your thought process at that very time as to how are you going to build it? And um, you know, did you, what were your expectations and how would it turn out to be? Well, let's take the missions one by one. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the first one is clinical. You know, I tell every uh, neurosurgeon who um, uh, applies for a job here, you know, all of our other missions come back to the clinical mission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why do we do research? Because we want to find ways of treating patients that are more effective than what we have now. Why do we teach um, residents and fellows? Well, we want them to be able to go out and take care of patients better than the way we do now. It always comes back to the patients. So the first job uh, for a neurosurgeon who applies here you know, make sure you're going to do a really, really good job of taking care of your your patient. You know, you need to be um, smart and technically skilled and hardworking and all the things we, we know. So, um, but now we we, uh, we also want you to be able to do these other things. Um, so, in, in regard to um, teaching, that's really pretty easy because if you have a residency program, a fellowships then you know you have young people who are working uh, with the faculty and and they make the faculty's life easier they help out in a lot of ways but but take the um, you know the, the education mission as seriously as you do clinical care and research uh, I think a lot of places we've uh, you know, I've seen the um, programs that take the clinical care seriously, they take the research very seriously. Mm -hmm. But from an education standpoint, it's sort of, that will take care of itself. 
Um, one of the things I did as soon as I got here is we set aside uh, Fridays as a teaching day. And so we still do surgery. Um, um, we don't have block time on Fridays. We have the time that anyone can use. Mm-hmm. But we have a, a, an entire day set up for didactic teaching for uh, residents and fellows. Um, the rule is that if you haven't passed your boards, um, you're not supposed to be in the OR that day. You need to be in the, these meetings. You, 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 there's a knowledge base you have to, to gain. And I think uh, the residents and the faculty take that seriously. So it's, it's a, you know, um, I've seen places where, you know, conference time is from 6.30 to 7.30 in the morning before you're going to the OR. Well, of course, everybody in that conference is thinking about the case that's coming up. Nobody's paying any attention to what's going on in the, the conference. You have too many things to do. And so to actually set aside time for dedicated teaching makes a difference. And again, the residents recognize that this is something that doesn't happen every place. That the, the, you know, the faculty here take the teaching mission very seriously. I think that makes a, a big difference. And then we want our residents to be good teachers too. Um, you know, mentor the, the medical students. So, uh, everybody benefits. And from, from the research side, um, one of the things that we did that's very different than, um, many places is, uh, and I think the old model was the, um, you know, the physician scientist, mm-hmm. where you say, okay, I'm going to have 50% of my time as a clinician mm-hmm. and 50% as a researcher. Um, I don't know if that works in other uh, disciplines. I know it doesn't work in surgery because, you know, when, when you start out, you, you, you need to build your practice. You need to get first a local and then a regional, and hopefully a national reputation for your, your patient care. Um, you need to develop your skills. Uh, that doesn't end at the end of uh, fellowship. Um, and if, if you're doing it half time and your competitors are doing it full time, um, you've really handicapped yourself. Uh, by the same token, on the research side, um, you're going to be competing with PhD scientists who are doing this full time. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're going to be competing for grant funding, um, and space, et cetera, et cetera. If, if you're doing it half time and they're doing it full time, I'm pretty sure who wins. Yep. Um, and so what we've tried to do here is to pair our uh, young uh, clinical faculty with a PhD in our department, which mm-hmm. makes a difference, mm-hmm. and say, you know, really be partners. Uh, it can't be the PhD saying, oh, just send me the tissue and I'll, I'll take care of it. And it can't be the MD saying, well, look, here's what I want to do. You just go to the lab and do it. That, that's not a partnership. But, but if you have two people who work together and say, this is something we'd really like to uh, develop together, then I think you actually gain a competitive advantage, um, both from the standpoint of developing your national reputation as a physician and in getting grant funding if you're uh, an investigator. And it's worked very well. And we have these partnerships in lots of different areas in neurosurgery now where We've been able to uh, advance the, the, the clinical and education missions um, together, or right. in clinical and research missions. Together. Thank wow. you. Very, thank you. very impressive. I think you successfully built this fundamental platform where all the core missions could thrive and also set up this team building, you know, this connecting the PhD with the with the MDs. This is this is a unique idea. I'm very, I'm very impressed. And I think anytime when you combine uh, these things and create the synergies, I think that those relationships go long. Let's shift gears towards the academic medicine and what is the future of academic medicine. You, you really uh, talk about the triple threat. In today's environment, with some competing obligations, 
triple threat can only be achieved by very few. So in your mind, what is your vision and what is what are your views about the future of academic mm-hmm. medicine? Which way we are heading? Mm-hmm. So, so you know, as we all know, um, you know, there are more and more pressures on an academic um, career. Um, you know, medicine is becoming um, more and more of a, a business. And one of my favorite sayings is, you know, medicine is a business, but it's not just a business. And, and um, you know, I, w- one of the things I'm excited about in my role as a senior vice president for our academic practice division is how can we assure that we continue to have all of those things that make an academic career special as we become more and more corporate. You know, we have to be successful from a business standpoint, or we can't support any of the other missions. That's understood. But but how do we do that and still be able to teach and be able to do research and to have those aspects of an academic career that you, you don't find in a, a non-academic practice? Um, so I think that's going to be the, the challenge um, going forward. And once again, I think some of the things um you know we've already talked about you know you know partnering with phds you know setting aside some time for education all of those sorts of things are going to be really important to to continue to have academic medicine be um what we've always uh, admired um it, it's really important we we don't want to you know give up all the things that make an academic career special but we have to fit that into a business model. That loops into our next question. And at the national level, I mean, talking about all across U.S., with the with the uh, you know with the with the business models taking over all the healthcare across the country, if you look at if you know we if you look at the young career mid career uh, young physicians and the mid career physicians. There is a certain degree of, uh, uh, you know, people say that there is a certain degree of disconnect from from the from the from the corporate models. Disconnect in the sense that people think that decisions can be made at higher levels without taking the without taking the young or mid career physicians on board, and the growing frustrations among the among the academic physicians across the country as to you know how can they do it all. So my first question is, as a senior physician yourself in the leadership role, what can the physicians do to bridge the gap between the boots on the ground and the decision makers? And where do you think is the future of healthcare going with this? Well, I think, you know, it's going to take an effort um, from both sides um, to make this work. I think at, you know, if you have a pure business model, that model is sort of a few people are going to make the decisions mm-hmm. and they're going to tell everybody else what to do. And then you carry them out. And if you carry them out well, you get uh, rewarded. Um, traditionally, the academic model was, um, you know, you really wanted to reward innovation and mm-hmm. autonomy and say, you know, um, let's let's see what you can discover. Mm-hmm. Um, those are very, very different models and how to bring them together is a a challenge. Um, I think one way is is just better communication. When when I see the problems that we deal with here, it's overwhelmingly because of a lack of communication. Someone thought they had told the other person that this is what was going to happen, but they really hadn't. Or, you know, what I thought I communicated to you is not what you heard. And so having the, the, the uh, faculty members, whether it's at the chair level or the junior faculty, be involved in the decision process, I think that's really important. Uh, it may not come out the way they want it to, mm-hmm. but, but they need to be able to weigh in and say, well, here are some things that I think are important. And it's surprising how often mm-hmm. you, you get really, really good ideas that the smaller group just didn't think of. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we had the vice chair's meeting um, um, and 
you know, I'm always impressed that just opening it up for discussion, what happens is you have ideas that come to the, the surface that you say, why didn't I think of that? You know, this, this was a really a good idea. And I think it makes the final product better, but it also makes it much easier to enact these things. If someone's just given an edict, you know, this is the way you're going to do it. The, the, the first reaction of most people is to bristle. You know, who are you to tell me that's what I'm going to do? On the other hand, if you say, look, let's, here's the problem. Let's talk about this. What, what do you think? Uh, even if at the end of the day, you get to that same decision, now you don't have the resistance to do it because people will feel like they, they've had a part in, in building it. So I think, again, it, it's, that's an important piece for how academics is going to fit into this business uh, model. One final observation is we, we do have a chain of communication that's supposed to go all the way from the CEO to the, the intern. Um, and so there are a lot of links there. And, and we have to be able to rely on each link being strong, that, that you know, um, that, that decision gets communicated as far down as it has to go or as far up as it has to go. Um, and often what we find is that there's a weak link. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, the decision, uh, the plan was shared with the chair, but the chair never shared it with anybody else. Or the concerns of the faculty made it to the vice chair who decided it just wasn't important and wasn't going to pass along. So making sure that chain of communication is intact, I think, is really important, too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I was just thinking this also, you know, uh, talks about your leadership style. I think you gave the example of the right to uh, meet him. I was part of it too. So um, thank you very much for uh, your excellent response. And, you know, what I was thinking is that uh, when you gave the example of the communication and I was present in that, this, uh, the vice chair meeting, I think what you allowed everybody else is like, you know, you, you ask, you just seek their ideas. You, you got their input. So there are certain skill sets which the current generation of healthcare leaders, they need to develop. They need to improve upon those. So yes, we went to med school to be a doctor. We went to residency so we can practice in a supervised session uh, settings. Then you are, after the residency, you can practice independently, but developing the skill set to be a healthcare leader is maybe that you may need something more. So in your view, what kind of skills that we as clinical faculty need to develop to do a good job as healthcare leader? So um, you know, a couple of things. Uh, one is, uh, yeah, I, I think we have to recognize how big a part of our life, our profession is. Um, and one of the things that, that I think has been a problem in the last few years is the, the term work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, you hear it all the time. Um, but, but what it implies is that your work isn't part of your life. It's like they're separate. And in fact, you know, your work is a huge part of your life. You know, it's, it's how you make your, the, the, the rest of your life and your work life work together. And, and that's, uh, um, I think something that we need to work on the, uh, our, our trainees with. Because if, if the view is, well, uh, you know, I have my duty hours in the, the hospital. And when I leave the hospital, my, my work is done and my life begins. That's a recipe for disaster. I mean, at first you can't learn that way. You mm -hmm. need to read outside and do a lot of extra things outside of the hospital. But you also kind of can look at, um, 
this as though there's an antagonistic relationship between your work and your life. When, when the, 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 I've always felt one of the most important things about my life is my being a neurosurgeon. You know, that's part of my identity. This is, I, I love doing that. Well, why, why would I separate it from the, the rest of my life? So that, that is one thing. I think just how we, we, we look at this going forward. The, the other thing I think that's really important is we're going to have to have, um, Physician leaders who understand the business world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if if you're um, uh, again, if, it, if it's just an antagonism between you know business and medicine, then it's, it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. And the since it's the business that uh, brings in the dollars that that allows us to get paid, I know who wins that one. And so I think having um, physician leaders who do get degrees in things like, you know, masters of health administration or MBAs, you know, it is important because we, we need people to be able to speak both languages, if you will. So that that's one area. And it's an area where I've encouraged people in, in both residents and faculty to, to get that kind of, of training. Um, and then the other piece to this, is, uh, again, I think it comes down to personality. There's, I've noticed there may be a substantial difference between um, personality of a physician and the personality of a business person. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as a physician, you're trained, you, you want to be caring, you want to you know, try to understand, you want to you know, uh, sacrifice yourself because it's going to help somebody else. That's really not the business model. You know, the business model is I'm going out to win, and so uh, doesn't mean they're bad people. It's just just a different culture, mm-hmm. and, and we have to figure out how to to bring them to together um, better. And I think there will be position leaders who who can do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I we can't agree more. I think you know some uh, positions who represent positions. And have a business acumen at the same time, or, or the true, uh, you know, need for future. So, ending on that, my last question for you is: uh, You have a very, you have had a very successful career as a chair of neurosurgery. Your your efforts have been recognized at national level, at institutional level. People respect you. People love you. People are inspired by you. When you tra- when you transition from a chair role to a bigger senior vice president role at the whole institution, what is your vision? And what is your, in your mind, when you start this journey, what are your parameters of success for future? So again, I, the way I see the role of the senior vice president for the academic practice division of our medical group mm-hmm. is to say, you know, for us to survive, for us to have an academic medical center, to be able to do research and teach and care for patients, we have to be successful from a business standpoint. If, if we're not, then we can't do any of those things. So, so that is vitally important. But how do we do that and, and keep these other aspects of an academic practice that are so important? How do we integrate the academic practice division into the larger medical group, into the larger Penn State Health system? And that's where the, the challenge is. You know, at this institution, um, for m- yeah. most of the time that it's been in existence, we were a standalone academic medical center. Mm-hmm. We were here. People sent us patients. We took care of them, sent them back. All's right with the world. Um, there were you know, there wasn't any other similar game in town, so, mm-hmm. so, so mm-hmm. we didn't have a lot of competition. And of course, all of that's changed. Um, and now we have a, a medical group that includes a, a large and growing community practice division so that people uh, in the community who used to be our competitors or referring physicians, mm-hmm. uh, often both, um, um, are now our partners. Mm-hmm. That's that's a different arrangement. So how do we do that in a way that allows us to accomplish all the things we want to accomplish as academic physicians, 
and still make sure that we're um, uh, successful as a, a business. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my goal. Thank you, Dr. Harba, for your time and your uh, this morning and sharing your thoughts about the future of uh, healthcare leaders. Truly appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I think uh, you have been a source of inspiration for me as well. And I hope that uh, uh, people who are watching this and doing this, they learn something. So thank you. Well, thank you. It's been an uh, interesting experience. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.